I never liked reading superhero comics when I was growing up. The costumes seemed outlandish, seemed ridiculous, and the stories seemed really simple. Actually, it wasn't until I finished graduate school that I started to appreciate superhero comics. What I really enjoyed about them is that they started telling me about how social change works, about how all of us, in some sense, can be a hero, but not in the way that we would think. Right? When we think of heroes, we tend to think about somebody who puts action in front of thought. We tend to think about somebody who can bend the world to their will. Take, for instance, this picture. Uh, the very first Superman story, Action Comics, number one, uh, published in June 1938. In it, we see Superman rushing out, grabbing a car that's full of criminals to keep them from driving away. And look at the expression on the bystanders' faces. It's clear that they haven't seen anything like this before. They're filled with shock and amazement. Uh, here is somebody who looks like a human, but yet somehow possesses superhero, superhuman powers. The, the banal title actually even says it all, Action Comics. And isn't this what we think of when we think of a hero? Someone who jumps into action without perhaps thinking first? Someone who has the man of steel, who has strength, but not necessarily the capacity to feel? I think this notion of superheroes has actually gotten in our way. I think this idea of being heroic is no longer useful for those of us who live in a complex society. And what I'd like to do today is to tell you what I've learned from superheroes. And that is, to become a hero, you have to radically open yourself up to the environment that surrounds you. Superheroes do this three ways. First of all, they gather information. Second of all, they let the world transform them. That is, after all, how they get their superpowers. And finally, they need to come to the realization that they do not possess the power. All power comes from the universe that surrounds them. So, first of all, superheroes need to gather information. This has been, this has been, this is a very old part of comics. Even the Man of Steel, Superman, needs to change out of his tights and put on the white shirt of the journalist, Clark Kent. Although we don't read as many pages about Clark Kent in Superman comics, Clark Kent is just as important for Superman taking effective action because it is Clark Kent that tells Superman where to be Superman, where to operate. Later on, in the 60s and the 70s, we start getting a shift. More superheroes choose science rather than journalism as a career choice. <laughs> and some of this, and some of this actually comes about because there's a greater realization of the transformative power uh, inherent in the Earth itself. Two of the most popular, of course, are Dr. Xavier, a telepath who is undercover as a geneticist who leads a school for gifted children in the X-Men comics, and Reed Richards, or Mr. Fantastic, who is an inventor and a physicist who can bend his uh, body into fantastic configurations because he had been transformed by cosmic rays. So um, this brings me to the second point, and that superheroes gain superpowers by living through a disaster. Okay? So this is how the su superheroes let the world transform them, is uh, they actually live through a disaster, and these are often horrible disasters, the types of disasters that would kill most people who are involved in them. The superhero is the one individual, often, who gets up and walks away from this disaster. But they do not walk away unscathed. Superheroes often register 
a certain primal quality about that disaster as a memory within their body that gives them their superpower. Spider-Man, for instance, gets bit by a radioactive spider. This is, allows him to get his spidey sense and his ability to climb vertical surfaces. Um, the Hulk is bombarded by gamma rays. The daredevil is doused with radioactive waste and, is in, and because of that increases his sensory capabilities. It's reiterated over and over and over again. It's not so much that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's that what you survives gives you a specific type of power. And that's an important difference. The first one concentrates on the notion of strength, the strength to endure the disaster. The second one's about transformation and the ability to let your environment transform you. Now, <laughs> actually, I love this illustration of Swamp Thing. He's here bringing you flowers. <laughs> and um, this brings me to my final point, and this was uh, something I think was work best worked out in 1982 with uh, the work of Alan Moore, uh, a very famous comic book author in the Swamp Thing saga. Moore inherited Swamp Thing, and uh, the DC comic book people wanted to give, uh, actually give Swamp Thing new life by bring, bringing in Moore to bring him back to life. And in the first issue of Swamp Thing, Moore rewrites this very interesting scenario where he has a doctor who's thawing sw Swamp Thing out from deep freeze, okay? And the doctor recognizes as he's thawing out Swamp Thing, that, wait a minute, this being is, co is composed entirely of plants. Although he looks like a human, he's made entirely of plant tissue. His lungs look like lungs. They pump air, like your lungs. But at the same time, it's all plant material. This is a profound realization. Alan Moore turns the notion of her, the hero on its head, right? Swamp Thing becomes a hero because Swamp Thing is not human. Swamp Thing becomes a hero because Swamp Thing is associated with the world. He's composed of plants. His body has the capacity for plants and this human consciousness ends up only contemplating how imperfectly human he really is. And I think this is some of the poignancy of Swamp Thing. When I read Swamp Thing, what I think about is how imperfectly human I am. I am composed of elements of the world, just like Swamp Thing. And I use these elements to help transform the world around me. I know people, for instance, who use metal to create exoskeletons that can make them go faster than a speeding bullet. I know other people who use a different type of metal, silicon this time, in order to extend their nervous system out into the universe, in order to get information and process information about a complex world. Now, the reason why Swamp Thing's story is so important for us is it tells us how we can get in touch with our powers. We get, empower, we get in touch with the powers not through projecting our humanness on the world. We get in touch with our powers by paying attention to those moments where we don't fit in, those painful those uncomfortable moments. Those are the moments that are calling us for transformation. Those are the moments that are prodding us on to have new capacities and to think and act beyond what we thought we could. Now, we live in a complex society 
And I think action first heroism is getting us into trouble. What I've learned from superheroes is that we need to get further in touch with our environments. And sometimes our notions about human exceptionalism, upholding one group of humans over another, or upholding humans over the rest of the species of the earth, actually get in the way of the greatest sources of our, of our power. And that's our being in touch with the universe itself. There are three points. Gather information. Allow the world to transform you. And then come to the realization that any power you have comes from the world and will eventually be used to help the world transform itself. With great power comes great vulnerability. And in order to harness this power, we must first let go of our cherished ideas of who we are to embrace what we must become. Thank you.